Good afternoon, ladies. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our fifth annual Women's Leadership Initiative Series session. Um, my name is Lena Hill, and I often compete on campus for having the longest title and wearing the most hats. Uh, but the hat I am so pleased to be wearing today is that of serving as the Interim Chief Diversity Officer and Associate Vice President. So I get to welcome you, some of you maybe, for the first time to this series. And um, I'm just excited that you have decided to spend your lunch hour with us. I know that you are going to enjoy this. And for those of you who are returning for maybe the second or third, fourth, even fifth time, thank you for deciding to continue to support what is um, the very necessary continued dedication to dialogue around all the challenges that we know women face in the workplace. Um, as many of you may have noticed, we're recording this session, and that will offer an opportunity for those of you who'd like to continue the conversation later um, after today's event. In the next few weeks, you'll be able to access this. And you'll also, um, if you are interested, be able to have discussion guides to host a discussion in your area. And if you go to this site, um, where I'm sure Liz has that information, you'll also see past sessions, um, so you can get a sense of what's happened in, in the past if this is your first time joining us. But before we get too far beyond today's event, um, it is a privilege for me to get to introduce our speaker for the day. Um, Dean Guardiol really just defines and challenges all systems that we think of that might keep women outside. She was named Dean of the Henry B. Tippy College of Business at the University of Iowa in 2012. Previously, she was Beeman Professor of Business at the University of Tennessee, where her leadership roles included Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs, as well as Assistant and Associate Dean for the College of Business Administration. She has served in leadership and volunteer positions for international business school associations, including the MBA Roundtable, the Graduate Management Admissions Council, and AACSB. Dean Guardiol is a board member of the United Fire Group and the University of Iowa Community Credit Union. Throughout her academic career, she has been the recipient of several teaching awards, and if anyone has heard her speak, this is not a surprise. And she has published on the topic of customer value and satisfaction, including her book, Know Your Customer. She is a frequent public speaker for academic, corporate, and nonprofit organizations because to hear her speak once, is to have the seed planted and the desire spring to hear her again. Um, and she also has worked with a variety of companies, including Procter & Gamble and Frito-Lay. She earned her undergraduate and MBA degrees from the University of Arkansas and her doctorate in marketing from the University of Houston. A native of Hot Springs, Arkansas, and that is so appropriate, uh, Sarah and her husband, Jeffrey Gleason, who I just learned last weekend, is a pretty impressive guitar player in a local band. Two. Um, two. two. Oh my goodness, two. I've only, heard, I've only had the pleasure of hearing him in the one, um, but it was great. Uh, they both enjoy motorcycle riding and traveling, and I, I joke that I, now it makes sense, her love of leather, and I laughed when she walked in wearing leather because I was already, I love leather too, so I can appreciate a woman who is not afraid to put on some black leather, um, and that is Dean Guardian. She uh, is also has two, da two grown daughters, Meredith and Julia, and the other thing I have particularly enjoyed um, about Sarah getting to know her over the years is she is a colleague who you can go from asking advice in terms of how to really balance, or she told me don't use the word balance. When I started to uh, take on more administrative, more administrative roles, she said, don't strive for balance, just manage, because otherwise you might always be disappointed. Um, but I've always just appreciated her willingness to talk about family, talk about uh, her love of being a mother and the choices that many of us make with the many hats that we do wear. Uh, she's just as comfortable giving you that advice as she is in terms of offering um, guidance uh, as far as leadership ideas. So today her session, Plans and Passions, How to Navigate Your Career, will surely give you a valuable insight to success, brilliance, and what I describe as fierceness. <coughs> And I hope that you really understand all that I'm trying to capture in the connotations of fierceness, because I think it is very apt in describing Dean Guardiol. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Fisher Guardiol.
thank you very, very much. Um, this is like my favorite thing. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is my favorite thing in the world, which is to be in a room full of women. Uh, talking about how we move ahead individually and collectively. Uh, I love the energy. I love the, the honesty of the conversations that we can have. And so I'm just thrilled. I thank you or whoever got me here uh, for the invitation. I'm happy, happy to be here. And I want to say that. Um, I'm, I'm going to draw some ideas here, both from telling my own story, a little bit about me, um, some things that I've observed over the years in terms of careers of other people, and really numerous conversations I've had with um, our executives and our alums, who Lynette will tell you are out doing the most amazing things. And so this is kind of my collective thoughts about planning versus passions versus, you know, how you pull all that together in a career, okay? Um, and I hope to leave a lot of time for conversation, but I always have more to say than time will allow, so I'll just have to be mindful of that. Um, let me start by this. Uh, 
internships in Washington, D.C. for African Americans. Oh, okay, great. But, you know, he says, I'm only going to entertainment. I don't want to go to politics. And she said, oh, well, like, BET is there. What are some things that we can kind of open that door? And she did. And then he got into the entertainment side. And then he went to, you know, all kinds of things, including Spotify. And now he's at YouTube. You know, you hear these stories over and over and over. And, and what you understand is that there's a great deal of serendipity about what happens in life. And that doesn't mean don't plan. But what I say is this. Have a plan and hold it lightly. Oh, I gotta do that thing next, right? Because I'm a big believer that life brings us things that are unexpected, and frankly, I think life often brings us things that are bigger than our dreams. That if we really did do what we planned to do, we would have maybe dreamed a little bit too small. All right. So first of all, I am, you know, the dean of the College of Business, and I am not standing up here saying have a plan, have a five-year plan. I'm saying yes, you have goals, you have all kinds of visions and passions and those kind of things. But you know, the, the path to getting there is as infinite as we are. Right? Um, OK. There we go. I, I just said that. Serendipity happens. It's just the way that, that life works. And thank goodness, it's the richness of life. Um, but you have to be ready to jump when the opportunity is there. And that's why we prepare. That's why we continue to develop ourselves professionally. That's why we put ourselves out there and say yes to opportunities that come along. Because when that opportunity comes, we want to be ready and have the skills and, and, and say, yes, I can take that on next. All right, so it's not about uh, the serendipity piece. is not like sitting back and waiting for something to come to you. Because you're constantly putting yourself out there in a place where things are running over you, right? OK. Um, the most important thing, I guess, that I would like to say is uh, you need to follow your passion. Maybe another way, your interest, your curiosity. If you don't know what the next step is, to me, you can't lose by saying, gosh, what looks interesting to me? What, what looks exciting to me? I will just tell you, I never set out to be the dean. I never set out to even be in leadership in higher education. Uh, now, in hindsight, side, that seems pretty stupid because uh, both my parents are educators. So I think I'm probably genetically wired at some point for this. But my dad was actually the president of a community college. And one day I woke up and said, oh, I think I've kind of followed some footsteps here. It was completely unconscious because the decisions for me were all about, oh, that looks fun to do, right? And I'll, I'll give you an example. So I was in the MBA program. And I was going to just graduate, go out and work in corporate America. Um, but one of the things that I really loved was market research that really got inside people's heads. And um, I exhausted all the courses that I could take. There was one PhD level course left out there. And so I thought, well, you know, all I can say is no. So I asked uh, somebody if they would give me permission to be in that class, even though I wasn't a, a PhD student, obviously. And they said, sure, and they let me in there. And um, all of a sudden, the first time I started hanging out with people who were preparing for a career in academia. So this is you know, kind of late in graduate school, even for me. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, this is interesting. Hadn't, hadn't really thought about this. I thought MBA and done. And all of a sudden, this opportunity was there in front of me. But because I followed that passion, um, if you've got to, to do that is, is listen to this. I think I might say this at some point. We work far, far too many hours in our lives to not be doing something that feeds us. All right? If not, the energy is just being sucked out. And it's not being filled back very well. And you really need to put yourself in a place where you get up every day and what's coming to you is feeding you. Now, it doesn't mean it's not hard, and it doesn't mean we don't work hard. But without the passion, the curiosity, the, int the interest, um, you're just going to be sucked bone and dry. So follow your passion, do hard work, network, seek mentoring, and don't underestimate your value. These are the five points that I want to make, and then we'll, we'll open it up, OK? Uh, ooh, be proactive. Here we go. <laughs> I've already said this. Uh, follow your interests, passions, and strengths. What's 
sparks you. All right, I think women are particularly good at this. We tend to listen to our intuitive sense more than um, the other side does. And so we know when we're feeling that energy. Sometimes we even feel it physically, right? Sometimes you can, you can actually feel your blood pick up and, and your ears are up and you're like, oh, you know, and what's next? Uh, you know, I, I tell students that come to the university and don't have any clue what they want to do, uh, you'll know it. You'll know it when you get there, when you feel it and all of a sudden it's, I want more of that, right? That's what you're listening to. Oops, I went too far. I don't know if I get this back or not. Dead commit. Um, help is on its way. Help, 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 help. <coughs> um, so, um, I also think that women are very good. We know this about corporate America. Women are very good about creating their own paths. Men are much more typical to see a, a hierarchy and say, I'm going to go from here to here to here to here. And women take these circuitous routes. We, we kind of are free to do things differently. And, and, and part of it is, I think, you know, that whole, like, we need that next title. We need that next, that next, you know, is something that just never occurs to us as, as being something that's fulfilling. But the other thing is, you know, we have things in our lives that pull us in different directions, like biology, <laughs> right? Like as far as I know, we haven't figured out how men have babies yet, <laughs> right? And so women have to step on and off sometimes our career paths more often than men do. And when we do that, we have to get a little bit more creative about how that happens, all right? But, you know, we're always coming back to this question of, you know, kind of the what next. And I say that intuitive, passionate piece is, is you cannot go wrong. Cannot go wrong with it. Okay, we know this. We know that hard work is, is part of the equation. And, and, again, putting yourself out there. And, you know, I'm preaching the choir on this. Because when you're in the heartland, when you're, you know, in middle America, we do know how to roll our sleeves and get things done. And I see it all the time, and I hear it all the time from the, the employers that hire our students on the East and West Coast. How do we get more of those kids from Iowa? They're awesome, right? Um, but part of it is, is just showing up, all right? Part of it is, is not, you know, just taking what's on your plate and, and, and keeping your head down and grinding away at it. Part of it is looking around for opportunity and saying, oh, I'd like to do that. What, could, could you help me do this thing over here? Or what if, what if you take my plate and expand it, right? That's part of the equation is, is looking around beyond where you are and showing up and saying, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready for that next thing. Now, we could do a whole another hour on this and then some. Women, way more than men, are likely to hold themselves back from taking on things that they don't know everything it is they need to know. All right, we know this. So men will take a job description and say, I've done 40% of that, I'm in. <laughs> right? What's this? Um, and women look at it and say, well, I've only done 80%. I guess I'm not qualified. <laughs> this is true. This is true. And I, I will tell you, I've had men managers come to me and say, one of the most frustrating things is to go to a woman and say, i am got you slotted for this next move, and the woman is like, oh, I don't think I'm ready, right? We do this to ourselves. We'll come back and talk about that another day. But part of the lesson is being willing, being willing to step up and step out and say, yeah, I'll go take on the diversity effort for the campus, right? Um, ask for more. Ask for more than what you're doing. I mean, a lot of good things come from that. One is visibility, uh, which is always good. And I know that sometimes as women, we feel like we shouldn't have to show our visibility. And women will say this to me. If I just keep my head down and work really hard, people will notice. Not always. Not always. Sometimes you've got to put yourself in a position where people are seeing the good work that you're doing, right? And that can kind of cut against our brain. But it's true. It, it really needs to happen. But always ask for more, and ask for more in a way that's growing your portfolio, that's growing your skill set, right? One of the things that I said is, you know, when those opportunities come along, you've got to be ready.
ready to jump. So if you're always saying, what's that next piece that I need to add to my expertise, my skill set, part of the time you get that is for asking for it and saying, you know, I can learn a lot if you let me do that, right? Um, and say yes as often as you can. Now this comes on the heels of you know, work-life management and, and those kinds of things, but um, you know, yeses will put you in surprising places, right? That you didn't really think about and anticipate. And so when someone comes along and says, would you, could you, and it seems to you know, kind of fit the larger narrative, say yes as often as you can, because it's good for you personally, professionally, in all kinds of ways, okay? But don't overdo it, that's <laughs> all right. Um, so here's, here's my story. I was at a conference um, of, of business school people, and I was at that crossroad where I really needed to decide whether I wanted to wholeheartedly move into leadership and administration or whether I really needed to hang on to my faculty position, which I loved, by the way, loved being in the classroom, loved the writing I was doing, the students I was working with. I was not looking to leave something that I, I didn't love, but I was being called in a lot of ways to consider this possibility of moving into leadership. And so I was sitting in the audience, there was a panel of deans, and one woman in particular was there, and she just struck me as really having it together, and I thought, I would love to talk with her. So um, I'm going to talk about mentoring just a little bit. So I actually went up to her after the session and said, you know, we're going to be here for a couple of days. Could you grab coffee with me during one of these breaks? I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about whether I need to move toward being a dean or not. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And she, of course, said yes. People say yes all the time when you ask them for these kinds of, of advice and opportunities. Um, she and I ended up being great friends, but here's how this conversation went. Um, here's me. I love my job. I love the students. I love being in the classroom. I love writing. Uh, I, you know, there's nothing I hate worse in life than sitting in meetings where nothing happens, <laughs> right, and not having flexibility of my time. And when I look at what I'm doing versus the dean position, it feels like I'm going to be giving up all the things that I love, or the whole whole bunch of it, and spending a lot of time doing things that I don't love. I mean, that literally was how I was saying it. And she said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> she said, um, Here's the deal. She said, you know, all those tables that you're sitting around, um, not all the time, but a lot really important decisions are being made there. And you can decide to be there or not. Wow. And that, I just had to step back and think about that. Because then you've got to decide, you know, whether you're going to be one of those people that wants to be at the table, that wants to be a part of those conversations, that wants to help people, institutions, whatever, move forward. Because if you're not, then you've got to be okay sitting back and letting all that stuff go on around you and not complaining about it, by the way. <laughs> right? And I knew, I just, I, I knew myself enough to know that even though it was a, a mixed bag, I needed to be at the table. And so that's, I think that's the bottom line. I think you've got to decide that for yourself. Do you want to be at the table? Do you want to be there uh, where those responsible, important decisions are being made for something, hopefully, that you're passionate about? And especially if it's, I get up every day thinking I do the, the most important thing in the world, which is not about my job, it's about our students, right? And where they're going to take us and take this community and this country. You know, do I want us to get that right? Absolutely. Put me at the table, right? Okay. All right. Networking. I'm going to go through this quickly because there are other opportunities to hear about this, but I just have a couple of points that I want to make. Um, you know, I, I think that we all are responsible for curating, meaning we get to select, right, our mentoring team. Now, if it was football season, I'd say, all right, you can be the quarterback. Right? And then you select who's all you know, in the huddle with you. But, but the truth is, our jobs are to make sure that we are surrounded by the support, advice, the guidance, the love 
of, of people that we can tap into as we're moving forward in our careers because we're going to constantly be, we're doing it right, getting up against things we don't know exactly how to do, right? And we need that, that wise and listening person there with us. And so I put a couple of people. So the, the blonde woman, that's Karen Newman. She's the one that said you can either be at the table or not. From me asking her to have that cup of coffee, she became a mentor of mine for years. Um, but my, there's my river girls. Um, this is uh, this is kind of my group of women that I've known for 20 years. You know, where you don't even have to explain where you're coming from because they know in a heartbeat, they know your history, they know everything you've been through. But they're also that honest mirror that holds it up to you and says, we see this going on, right? You gotta have that. You gotta have that in your friends, right? And then this last one, was kind of a recent outreach for me. Uh, some of you know that I infamously decided to uh, phase out a full-time MBA program, which caused quite a bit of upheaval in, in my world. Um, but before I did that, I reached out to this person I'd never met before. His name is Charles Iacoba, and he had recently, or two years earlier, he had closed down the MBA program uh, at Wake Forest. And I said, I need to talk with you. I'm, I'm, I'm staring this decision in the face, and I need to learn from your experience, right? And this is the curating part. This is the proactive part. This is you figuring out what you need and having the uh, you know, ability to, to, to go find people that either that you know or don't know to say, I need some help. And I will tell you that the idea of a mentor is crazy foolish. No one can serve all the different questions and needs that you have. That's why you need a team. So you need someone that can talk with you about the family issues and how do you balance that. And you need someone to talk with you about the specifics of your program. And you may need someone to help you um, figure out uh, how to advocate for yourself. And, and that may or may not be someone that you work with. But you get to find those people and, and pull them together, OK? All right, and men and women. Um, I, I think of it as kind of a matrix. Think about all the things that you need to work on and then think, well, who's, who's the person that might help me with that? And it can be a formal or informal mentor. Like I said, it could be from work, from your friendship circle. It could be uh, all kinds of people. But, you know, start filling that in and saying, if these are the things that are important for me to have guidance on, do I have someone or many someones who can help me with that? And if I don't, where are my gaps in there? And how do I go fill those gaps? Because that list on the, the, the left-hand side says, these things are important, and I may need help. And if you can't say pretty quickly, and here's who I would go to, then that's worth some thought on your part. OK, don't underestimate your value. I just had this conversation earlier today. But we know this from research. We know that women. Uh, aren't as confident about um, especially their salaries, what they should make, what they should ask for. We're just a little bit um, culturally, and I think also biologically, kind of wired to, to take whatever's left over and be fine with it, all right? Uh, you don't ever want to go into a situation where by failing to advocate or failing to negotiate yourself for yourself, you put yourself in a hole. So that 75 cents that we make on the dollar for every man out there, right? And that's in, and that's in a uh, title to title comparison, right? That that difference of 25 percent means that over a career, we would have to work women 12 more years than a man to make the same amount of money in the same jobs we had. Is that shocking? I mean, it's crazy. We're, and, you know, there are a lot of reasons that happens. It's not all on us, but some of it's on us, right? Some of it's on us to not undervalue what we do and to ask for, not the moon, but reasonable, you know, compensation for what we're doing. Or, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's not money. It's, sometimes it's about, can I have some time off? Or can you give me some professional development if I step up and do that project? There are all kinds of things we can ask for. We can come back and talk about that as well. But we just we we just know that that it's true that women, uh, if given the same job description as a man, 
and uh, they've done experiments and said, okay, how much do you think the salary should be on this job? Women always come in under the men. We do that to ourselves when we do it to others. We're always kind of undervaluing. Here's the problem, and I'm going to just fly through this. There is research, research, research that shows that women at the tops of organizations lead to better organization performance. We are needed. We are needed in leadership positions. Lack of diversity inhibits performance in organizations. More diversity, whatever performance dimension you want to pick, improves when there are people at the top that don't always see things the same way, right? So uh, another book that I might recommend to you, um, something called Reimagine by Tom Peters, and he goes through the list of characteristics that women have that are just innately stronger for us than they are for men. That doesn't mean better. They have complementary things. But we live in a world now where businesses are not about hierarchy. They're not about command and control. They're about flat organizations where there's sharing, there's collaboration, teams come together, they work through a problem, they disband, they move on to something else. In that kind of environment, the ability to listen, to form relationships with other people, to share, those are great skills. Just, I know it's a big stereotype, but who owns those? Women. We have a skill set that is so naturally fitted to today's work environment in terms of how things get done. And we need to step up and value that because you know, we need those opportunities, but our organizations need us to step up as well. So finally, be proactive. I love this. Don't wait for your ship to come in. Swim out to it. Um, we know, uh, this is kind of along the same lines, that women won't ask. Ask for what they need. Um, why do you think? Tell me, tell me why we don't ask. Anybody who's got an idea about this? Fear. Fear of what? Fear of failure? Rejection. Rejection? What does this make fear? What else? What, keeps, what holds us back? We think we can do it all anyway. We think we can do it all anyway? Okay. Yes? Pardon? Looking needy. Oh, yeah. We're looking like maybe we need help, right? We don't look helpless. Yes? Uh, we feel like we don't deserve it. We feel like we don't deserve it. We do. We do. It's true. We're going to uh, wrap off the confidence code uh, in a little bit. Yeah, uh, you know, I, honestly, if, if you, we had time and would dig down, for many of us, we feel like we don't deserve it. You know, and there are all kinds of reasons why that is, why our self-esteem and our self-confidence isn't, you know, what it needs to be and, and certainly isn't what it is relative to men. There's some cultural things about that. Um, I'll give you one quick example. Um, my, my daughter, who's a lawyer in Nashville, is just turned into such a, a flaming feminist. I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Nature, nurture, I you know. She says, yeah. <laughs> she says, Mom, have you noticed how we talk to little girls? Oh, you're so pretty. Oh, I love your drink. Look at those shoes. I have your hair, right? I do this. I, I will own this. I do this. We don't talk to little boys like that. We don't talk about how handsome they are, how pretty their clothes are. We say, look at this little man. Oh, you're so strong. Look at you, right? I mean, I'm glad, right from the get-go, we are sending these different messages about you know, what's important and what we should be about. And no wonder we grow up being insecure about the way we look and, and, and all kinds of things like that. But just, let me just say, the research is there to show that we don't ask. We don't ask at home, and then we resent, right? That's my story. <laughs> don't ask, but resent. That is not healthy. Um, but we don't ask in the workplace as well, right? Women managers will tell me they move into a new position and within days, the men that report to them are at their desk saying, when is my next promotion? I've got something else I want to be working on. Uh, how about it's time for a raise? And they're waiting and the women don't show up. OK? 
Okay? It's just truth, and there's a lot of research behind this. So I kind of got famous for this this year. I don't know if any of you saw this. There was a, an initiative, a, really a student thing on campus called Dear World. It goes all across the country, and they invite students to come in and to tell a story about something kind of pivotal that happened in their lives, and then you write that message on your body somewhere, your face, your hands, your arms, your chest, whatever, and then they take a picture. And so they did this here, and all the students, you know, pictures were posted, and, and they, I got a call from one of our students who was helping put this together and said, we want some, you know, campus leadership to come, will you come do it? Sure. So I went down and, and did it, and this was the result of it. And, and there are a couple of funny stories about this, but basically here's the story. Here was my pivotal story that popped into my head, but I think about this a lot. I said I grew up in the South. Um, funerals are big for us down there, all right? Not that we enjoy people dying, but we really enjoy the food and the gathering that happens around that and kind of take it to a high art, right? And this can kind of go on for days. And, and after a particular relative had passed away, and I've been in the kitchen for like three days, with other women, and it's like, okay, put the food out, get it on the table, everyone comes through, clean up, store it, send it next door to the neighbors because we're out of refrigerator space, more food coming in, what are we gonna do with that? I mean, you're doing, you're doing this, right, for days. And finally, after three days, I said, just an observation to the, the great aunt that was with me there in the kitchen, I said, you know, I've noticed, first of all, that no men have ever stepped Put on the linoleum of this kitchen while we've been in here. Um, but, but secondly, after we get all the food out, right, and we're putting out these beautiful spreads of food. We know food in the South. Um, but then here's the order of the eating, right? All the men would come through and fill their plates. And then all the children would come through and fill their plates. And then the women were the last group to come through. And I said, I'm just kind of noticing this. And she said, honey, in the last 50 years, all I've had is wings and backs. <laughs> Think about that plate of fried chicken, right? And what, what's left, you know, when everything else good is gone? And so I said, no more wings and backs. And I did my Rosie the River kind of thing, and someone wrote it on my arm. And here's the second kind of funny piece about this is that um, uh, I'm not on social media. I'm just not. And, I, for a whole lot of reasons, but I don't have a presence out there, I don't have a profile, I don't I have whatever. Um, but our social media person for the college got this, pulled it off the campus website, pushed it out on the college web, you know, social media, and it started getting shared, and then the alumni magazine picked it up and whatever, and all of a sudden, I, I'm not kidding, I've got people coming up to me on the streets going, <laughs> Skills. Don't you ever forget that. You're great at, you know, 
running things. But one good thing about a leader is to know when to include other people and listen to people's ideas. She's like, okay, mom. But, <laughs> you know, it's like we tell little girls that they're bossy all the time yeah. and that they're being an inconvenience or, yeah. you know what I mean? So. Yeah. Um, it is so subtle. It is so subtle. I'm, I'm not kidding. I, this is so sad. I was in my office today and someone came in to talk with me about one of our graduate students who had taken in a, you know, a list of graduate schools. It's undergrad. This is undergrad. Uh, these are graduate schools that she was interested in and was asking um, one of our faculty members um, you know, about helping her and what she needed to take. And he kept kind of chipping away at, I'm not sure you're good enough for that. You know, I, we just in subtle and non-subtle, all kinds of ways, and it starts very, very young, and we do have to pay attention to this. And by the way, you know, the moms are not the only ones who are concerned about this. Um, I've got a, a, a presentation I've done a couple of times about the, the differential between men and women in the workplace, and I do it in front of corporate mixed gender audiences. and. Um, Man, I'm telling you, it's the dads that are beating the path up to the podium afterwards saying, how are we going to stop this? Not, not my baby, right? We don't want her making 75 cents on the dollar, you know. Um, but it's just going to take, I think, a lot of awareness of, um, you know, again, what we're saying, how we're saying it, with, you know, how early, how early it starts. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with a little girl being pretty. But if that's the only message she's getting, if, we're, if that's it, and we're not developing, you know, our praise for executive skills or kind of a larger picture of what she is, that's the problem. If she starts thinking that it's all about how she looks, that's how we end up with eating disorders and things like that. Yeah. Anybody? Uh, yes, just please. Just to add to this, uh, one thing, this is something I've been very aware of too, is how we're talking to little girls. But another thing I also think about is how we talk about ourselves in front of little girls. Mm -hmm. um, and that is also something to just be aware of when you're talking about the way you look or, or anything like that. Um, those little girls are, are okay. listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and they will learn. They will learn from you know, people that they look up to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Other thoughts, comments, questions? Yes, please. What advice do you have for those of us in sort of a mid-level position who are looking to get a raise and, and how, what advice would you give to somebody to start that conversation with our supervisor? Yeah, well the first thing I do is say do your homework, right? Uh, go in knowing what you're gonna ask for and what's fair to ask for, right? And you know, we fortunately live and work in a world where everyone's salaries are out there and we know when things are posted and make sure and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, a little bit of homework helps because if you go in with some data about, you know, what the possibility, if I move up to this next level, this is what my expectation is, right? And so um, the, the more confident you are about the data that you have, the benchmark that you have, the easier it is to ask for it. Um, so I would always say don't go in until you're, you're pretty confident about what is a, a, a appropriate amount to ask for, okay, and you can find out. Um, the second thing I would say is practice the ask, all right? Be, don't let the first time you ask for it be the first time it's coming out of your mouth, all right? Um, here's, here's what we, we know about women is that we, we can like fiercely advocate for our best friend better than we can advocate, advocate for ourselves, right? So get together with someone and role play that conversation a couple of times until you get really comfortable articulating your strengths, why what you're doing merits that raise, what you bring in terms of value to that organization. And sometimes it takes a while to kind of script that in your head and get you know articulate, you know, kind of concise about that. So you, you kind of go in well scripted but well practiced so that when you are saying it, it's not the first time. It's, you know, I've done this over and over. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, we know that across the country, men and women graduating from MBA programs, the salary differential is about $7,000 in uh, the favor of men. Guess what? 
And um, so part of the reason, not the only reason, but part of it is that we also know women don't negotiate salaries. They, men are four times more likely to go into a, a job <coughs> situation and negotiate for something higher. So a couple of years ago, we did a negotiation workshop for our women MBAs, and we um, <coughs> gave them you know, some of these tips on you know, how do you go in and, and ask for more. And after the workshop, I love this, they got together and they, they kind of locked arms collectively and said, every one of us is going to negotiate salary. No one is going to take the first offer. A bold move, right? <laughs> and they said, not only that, but here was the second most important piece. And before the interviews, we're going to get together and help each other and, and have those role plays. And so that by the time they got to the interviews, they were much more comfortable saying, this is why I deserve, right? Which is not comfortable for all of us. Um, so that year, for the first time ever, collectively, the women's starting salaries were higher than men's. Mm -hmm. Yay. But what that means is it's a coachable, trainable thing. We haven't been coached and trained how to do that, but we can be, right? Yeah. I think I have time for one more. Yes. Yes. Thank you. 